This episode is great for aspiring comedians, writers, and people that feel held back by their environment. So instead of saying cross the road, we'll go cross road to the pub. <laughs> hey, old lad, want to go cross road to the pub? I've missed so many words out there, but we get to the pub quicker. <laughs> so that's, that's what we plan on doing. Daniel Holt is a Sheffield-born comedian who's turning his negative upbringing into a positive message of hope. You can do anything, really. Like If you grow up in that environment and get out, you just use that in any passion project you use, like comedy's mine. So it's just, I'm going to keep being the best I can be. I want to inspire people. In this week's episode, we talked about starting a career in comedy. Even the MC, the host of the night, came to me and he's like, you're not going to do well tonight, mate. And I was like, oh, it's my first time. He's like, yeah. Not the night for it. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, God, great. And he's like, how do you want me to introduce you? And I was like, uh, how have you won? Like, just something nice. He went, I'll say negative things. And I was like, mate, I don't want to go out there if you're going to do that. Breaking the cycle of intergenerational trauma. This is a bit brutal. Guy was like, you're going to die now. Shoved the blade in his mouth. And then, yeah, died like twice in the ambulance, was on a life support. He has got a big scar down his neck where they had to go in and reattach everything. And he's, he's still alive now, but still involved in the same lifestyle. And being a beacon of hope for his community. I didn't have a father growing up or a, a strong male role model. So if I could be that on stage for other young kids or, ad or adults or anyone like can watch me and go, oh, he's been through that. I've had a bit of that. And he's doing comedy. Wow, well, I can get up and do comedy as well. All right. Ready? Ready. Ready? Ready. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first show. My name is Frank Mank and I'm joined as always by my beautiful co-host, Joe Murray. Hello, Frank. And we are joined by the incredibly talented comedian... Daniel Holt. Hello, guys. How are we going? Do you prefer Daniel Holt or Dan Holt? Uh, I get a mix. Uh, I like Daniel Holt. Yeah, I'll go with Dan that. Holt. It sounds yeah. more professional. It does, doesn't it? It's got that little, little bit on it, yeah. It's got that. Some people do say Danny Boy, and I'll take that. That's all right. Oh. Yeah, especially when I live. That's a song, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, Danny, when yeah. I get knocked down. Yeah, That's yeah. All that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the south of England, they'll call me Danny Boy, bruv. Yeah. With the oh, bruv is like. Bruv, is yeah, that yeah. like a. Is that like a. Uh, That's um, like a mate. Like, like how a you say mate here, they go, they go bruv. <laughs> yeah, but in Sheffield, where I'm from the north, we're like, we say mate, or A up, or nah a, then. A up. A up, yeah, we don't say the Is H. that like mate? What, wait, is that? You go nah then, or A up. Uh, we we kind of cut off every word that you can. So instead of saying cross the road, we'll go cross road to the pub. <laughs> a up, lad, want to go cross road to the pub? I've missed so many words out there, but we get to the pub quicker. <laughs> so that's that's what we plan on doing. That's yeah. the idea. You cut as much time between you and the pub as possible. <laughs> yeah, to drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To antisocial behaviour. We socialise just so we can antisocialise later. Yeah, at yeah, the pub. Yeah, it's quick. Yeah, no, that's yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's but Daniel Holt works. Yeah, works Daniel for me. Holt. Yeah. Um, Daniel Holt, you're a comedian. You are fairly well known in the Brisbane comedy scene because you mm -hmm. run quite a few rooms around here. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to give your little, your quick little, we'll talk to you a quick little comedy bio first and then we'll kind of get into some more deeper stuff later. Cool, um, yeah. But let's let's talk about your, your comedy career. Comedy career, well actually sure, but a lot of stuff's happened in that time. So I've been doing comedy for around 10 months now. So not that long, but uh, in that time I, I've done well over 100 gigs, 150 gigs. I've done three festivals. And I run three rooms at the moment, yeah, in Brisbane. Wow. So I've been very action-packed on it. But before, like, uh, when I first came here, I came here on a working holiday visa. Don't know if you've done any of that, picking the fruit and everything. Yeah. You can't really commit to a passion project yeah, like when you're doing uh, that. music, which I love, or comedy. Uh, but now I'm on a partnership visa with my girlfriend. I get to stay in Australia. I get to focus on what I love. And when I put all my my love and passion into something, I, I won't stop. And, like, comedy is the thing I want to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I've done... Um, I gig like yeah every day I go to work I work in recruitment then after work straight to a comedy gig do a comedy gig sleep work same the whole way through and if I'm not at a gig performing I'm writing or I'm like plotting ideas of how I can get bigger and get better for later on in life with my, my career yeah yeah right um that is so much that you've achieved in such a short time. It's been quite a bit. Yeah, I'm surprised how well it's gone. Yeah. Uh, but like, I, I know, like, wh like I just have a lot of energy. I come to the stage with a lot of passion, and, and like, when you first start, you're never going to be good. Like, yeah. my first gig actually went really well. Like, I was like, so I invited all my friends, uh, and then there was like a crowd there. And that night, like, everyone was bombing, like, not doing well at all. Mm. And then even the MC, the host of the night, came to me, and he's like you're not going to do well tonight, mate. And I was like, oh, it's my first time. He's like, yeah, not the <laughs> night for it. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, God, great. And he's like, how do you want me to introduce you? And I was like, 
uh, how have you want? Like, just something nice. He went, I'll say negative things. And I was like, mate, I don't want to go out there if you're going to do that. But then I ended up going out there and I just did really well. Uh, I did bomb after that. Because <laughs> that's how it works. Like, yeah, I went out with adrenaline. I really sold my stuff. But, like, I realised early on, like, every comedian, well, your material's not strong enough. It takes time, takes a lot of writing, a lot of practice. So after that, it was bomb, 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 good gig. And then you just keep going. But I knew with more hard work, I can get to where I want to be uh, with my comedy career. And then just the opportunities popped up because I was always trying, always mm. messaging people or performing. They'd see me on stage, they'd be like, this guy's got potential. And then that ended up leading to getting my first comedy festival three months in. I was at the Sunshine Comedy Coast Fest on the Best of British so that was awesome. Like I've been doing comedy three months and it's considered, I uh, know I wasn't, but like that I could have a chance to be on the Best of British show. And I was only an opening act, but it was a, ch it was a start, it was a chance. So yeah. from there, like, yeah, from there, like um, just gigging more and more, I got onto another festival at Bush Dove, which was very interesting, doing, doing comedy to people high on acid. That's great, <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't know if the comedy is real or not. Is, you know? that a, yeah. is that a better than normal or a worse than normal? It was really fun, actually. I was like, this is not going to work. But it actually was really fun. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just good. Doing crowd work is amazing because they're like, who's talking? Like, they're, 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 who's God? that? Yeah, is that God? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was a really fun gig. And then recently I just come back from uh, the Melbourne Co uh, International Comedy Festival. Mm. So doing the British shows there. Uh, and that was unreal. Like that, I was on stage with like professionals, people I admire, and I've what I'd been doing it nine months. Like it was amazing. So it's gone really well, and I just plan to go up and up and up. Uh, but that'll only come with hard work, like with comedy or any career that in the in the arts. Like you've got to work so hard just to get a little bit of notice or attention, and then work on your craft every day. So yeah. yeah. And do you attribute that kind of like incredibly quick rise in the ranks of the Brisbane comedy scene to that? Just constant tenacity and hard work? Yeah, it's hard work. It's work ethic the whole way through. I think a lot of people, they'll see people get bigger and they don't know how they did it, but they don't know behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like that person's working, writing every day. Like some nights I'll get up and I'll not do maybe the best, but you put so much, like what, I'm writing new material. So you're just trying to get better. But they'll watch that and go, ah. Oh. But then they'll see another gig and you're just amazing. It's like, you've got to keep putting that work in. And with comedy, like you've got to fail in front of lots of people. Like you don't just go, it's not just like on your own or anything. You've got to go, right, yeah, I suck. And there's a hundred people that know that <laughs> for tonight. But then the next night you get better. It's just how it works. So you've got to keep putting yourself out there. Mm. Just hard work. And yeah, night and day. I think about comedy so much because I love it and adore it. It's, uh, so like, yeah, I'll wake up and I'm thinking about the jokes. I'm at my job, should be doing my job. Thinking about comedy, writing <laughs> jokes. That's when you know you're doing the right thing though, right? Yeah, yeah that's when you know you, yeah, you, you've got, you're on the right track, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What was that start of your career like dealing with the the pitfalls of failing constantly, having to fail constantly? Well, it's uh, it's never nice for any comedian. Like any comedian that says bombing's good, like they're lying. Like they'll, <laughs> they're, they'll, they'll go, I, I don't bomb. Then they'll get in the car and start hitting the car. Like I'll start hitting <laughs> the car seat, hitting the horn. But, you know, it's it's a part of it. Like you always get humbled in comedy. Like there's no, I, like even if you're good for like, say you solidly do a month and you just do awesome gigs, it's coming. Like, it's around the corner. It's going to get you at some point because every crowd's different. And also, you have to try new stuff again. If you want to build to that split show, to the hour show, you have to you have to bomb eventually. And uh, you just have to take it take it as it comes. It's a part of learning, like with anything in life. Like, if you're not, if you're not failing at something, you're not really learning. Because with that, it brings loads of other areas of, oh, I can work on this, work on that. Um, but yeah, it happens a lot. And any comedian... Uh, starting out it's going to happen you just have to take it but also it's amazing because you're doing something different and yeah you're growing as a, as a comic really yeah have you ever had a show go so bad or like a moment so far where you're just like oh maybe this isn't for me yeah definitely that happens yeah, yeah 100% <laughs> yeah so I was um, yeah doing a gig and then as soon as I got up there there was like some hecklers in the crowd and just immediately there was like I don't like this guy I didn't even say anything yet. So I'm like, immediately, there was like, I don't like him. But there was, there was heckling everyone all night. Uh, and then I wanted to say something back. Cause like, but in a nice way, trying to get, the, get him on board. But I was like, do you know what? Stay clear. And then I, uh, eventually I sat down. And then someone in the audience shouted a, a, something like negative towards them. And the boyfriend got up to look to fight the person. So I was like, thank God on stage. I didn't go... Funny joke, and then get a black eye, you know, <laughs> not like a little Will Smith style. I don't want any of that <laughs> stuff. You know I mean? We don't need that. Do you know what I mean? Any of that stuff. Oh, what is it? Was it Dave Chappelle? You know, like stuff like yeah. that. 
The, but there was one time it was a, a negative got t- changed into a positive. So at the Melbourne International Comedy Fest, I was doing a gig in front of some big comedians. Like uh, there's comedians here like Jim, Jim Owen, don't know if you know him. The producer for Jim Jeffries was at the show. Oh, wow. Okay. And I was like, oh my God, I need to do well. Like I, it's a big thing. And I was nervous and I was like, cool, we got this, we got this. So I was watching, I was the third on, I was watching the comedians on before. And again, there was a heckler the whole way through. And I was like, oh God. And the comedian on before me just didn't take a liking to this heckler at all. They got into such an argument, they nearly got into a fight. And I'm on after him. So I was like, sweet, my chance of making it has gone out the window. (laughs) So like, there was literally going, do you want to fight? Do you want to fight? And then they took it off stage and was arguing in the corner. The host tried to bring it back and he's like, everyone relax, blah, 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 you know. And as that was happening, because I've done a lot of crowd work stuff or shows where it's just all crowd work, there's no material, I started writing jokes on the spot about the situation or bringing up jokes I had from the past that would work in this scenario. So eventually when I got up on stage, it was still awkward. The tension was really high. But then I immediately just jumped on, addressed what the situation was and made a joke about, I've got a joke about like, um, how you, I'm half Indian, half English. How in Bollywood movies, like when they're going to fight, instead of fighting, they just start Bollywood dancing. <laughs> and the, then the problems are fixed and how we should that have that over here. So if you've got like an Australian who's like, you want to go, mate? You want to go? <laughs> and you just start Bollywood dancing. <laughs> and he's like, what the hell? And he just joins in and then conflict <laughs> resolved, you know? Uh, and I just brought that up and they just seemed to really get drawn into it. And then I wrote a joke on the spot about how in Melbourne they wear scarves. I don't know if it's so much yeah. the AFL. They look like they're in Harry Potter. <laughs> and I was like, you look more English than I do being Indian. And then I was like, the guy next to him had glasses on, like ha- Harry Potter. He looked like genuinely him. I was like, and the guy who was heckling looked like Voldemort. So I just used <laughs> that. And that joke just absolutely killed. And it just was a big uproar. And I had like one of the best gigs I've ever had in my life. So sometimes when the negative happens, just flow with it and you'll actually get a better response and afterwards I got off stage and professionals I admire who'd been doing it 13 years or longer or 15 or all their life were like that was amazing awesome in front of the producer guy and I was like keep saying that I <laughs> just, sweet, keep, yeah. talking, just keep, keep doing talking. that yeah yeah and it, was, it was amazing I got so much uh, just in case any respect. of you guys haven't got my number yet yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just chat yeah to say some more nice stuff yeah <laughs> but it was amazing yeah so sometimes it can be a positive in general so mm. you, you don't always have you don't always have to bomb you know you can you can sometimes change that and use the tension or what could be a bomb and change it into one of the best gigs you can ever have so yeah. that was a good experience for me yeah so you've got quite a lot of experience doing crowd work and, and dealing with kind of heckler situations yeah what was your first experience like with a heckler first experience uh let me think uh so yeah uh, just just doing uh, joe the worst is like than heckling i actually quite like it i like it when some so i can have a bit of a rebuttal and i like talking to people in general so taking crowd work on stage is still fun for me mm. but the worst is when people just talk and ignore you. Like, they'll, they'll, like right. that's the worst heckle for me. Cause it's like, they don't even want to try to engage with you. They're like, I'm going to eat my steak. I don't care what you're going to do. <laughs> like the drunk white girl that's like, hey, you can't get french fries. Like, yeah, just yeah. chatting in the back. Oh, yeah, they'll just be like, ordering a drink about just shouting. And then they'll always want to order cocktails. So like, you'll be doing a bit <laughs> and it's just here shaking over there. And you're like, sweet, yeah. And you just have to run with it, yeah. But like, the, yeah, probably the worst, I've had some bad heckles and stuff. Or where, where I thought sometimes someone's going to, like be aggressive or something, but I've always diffused it. Oh, I can remember one actually now. There was one guy I was doing crowd work with and he was loving it. It was his first time at a comedy show. It was at a gig in Indrapilly, Indrapilly Hotel. And this guy was like, yeah, and shouting out. And he's like, I love you to comedians. And he's like, I love your hair. Like, smile, oh, you're so beautiful to the female comics. So the guy comics is like, I love your, your dress sense, anything like that. And I was like, this guy loves it. So he was having a bit of a riff and all the audience was really enjoying it. And I was like, this is perfect. Till I made one joke to him that he just didn't take a liking to. And he just wasn't a fan. Like, it wasn't anything against him. It was a joke to go back with me, like to, to do some self-deprecation on me. But when I said that joke, he just went, no, kicked off. No, I'm not having it. That's it. No, you can't say that. You can't do this. And I was like, oh, God. And he's like, that's it. And he just went on and on and on for about two minutes. And I was like, Whew. I just had to take a bit of a grilling in front of everyone. I was like, All right. And I was like, are you done now? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm done. And I went, can I continue? And yeah, I couldn't continue. So I did. Then the next joke I did, he saw why I did it. And, it, and all the crowd was laughing. And he went, mid bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, That's really just sweet. yeah, just take some time, yeah. And then yeah. when I got off stage, like I was talking to my girlfriend, I was like, should I go over to him and shake his hand? She was like, no, no, no. He doesn't seem like the type. So I just waited, and he came over to the bar, and he's like, I'm really sorry. I just had like a bad day. Uh, I just, yeah, just let it out in that moment. I was like, okay, cool. And he, I was like, you're gonna stay for the rest of the show. He's like, yep. 
he was all good for the rest of the show. Oh, but that's yeah, lovely. But, yeah, I thought I was going to get hit, and I got a friend in the end, so it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's good. I yeah. always found the idea of heckling in a comedy show so interesting, though. Like, what mm. possesses someone to just? They think yell they're out? they're just as funny as the comics on stage, and sometimes you you can be funny in all walks of life, but it's a different way of being funny on stage. Yeah. So, like, if you ask them to get up there, they're like, no. But they're happy to be in a crowd and go, your shit, or yeah. you're, you're terrible, anything like that, or try and have banter with the comedian. So sometimes it's fun. And I, I like it. I do actually like it. And I can mess around with it. But then sometimes it's like when they get angry, you're at a comedy show. Have fun. Like, don't, not what we're saying is all jokes, nothing serious. Mm. That's one of my favorite. Uh, it's not really, a, it's kind of a bit, but from a, one of Bo Burnham's specials, is he has this whole bit where they go back and forth. He's like, this isn't a participatory thing. Like, yeah. I'm trying to immortalize something that I've spent six years of my life working on. Yeah, that's here. fair. Like, yeah. Where this shouldn't be happening. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, when you're in the middle of a bit, it's like, it's, it depends if you ask a question to the audience or there's a certain thing, sometimes it'll work with it. Uh, but if it's a mid bit, and the worst time is when they heckle just before your punchline, because it takes all that juice out of it. It's gone. You yeah. build it up, you've done all the tension, all the tricks you do. And then, yeah, they just take it out with something terrible like. Chips and fries, please. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just ruin it. Like, like you're like, what? What do you do? Or just do something random. Yeah, like they'll just shout like, oi. Like, what we already did introductions, man. Like, yeah, you're not know, like, hello, I'm Dan. You know who I am. Yeah, it, that can be the worst bit. But you kind of got to embrace it. You can never, you can't con control an audience. Yeah. It's, control it's a part of it, yeah. yeah. But you can make a bit of something work out of a negative and make it more funnier and yeah. then jump back into your bit, yeah. I think crowd control is an important part. But some comics don't like it. They like to tell their bits and have it like that. And it's, it's great. Like when you get your own solo shows, that audience will come for that but when you're building up through the ranks like you, you're performing in front of people who've been drinking for six hours they don't know what it's about they, they, they're like yeah I'm going to shout or I'm going to do something and yeah. you got to have a bit of fun with it yeah yeah, you got to just keep enjoying it keep enjoying it I enjoy it yeah like for me I just love engagement I love entertaining the crowd I also love when a crowd is they're just not on board and I love bringing the energy into the room and livening a, a room up and I, anything I can do to do that to get like I host a lot of my nights so my job is to do that some nights are perfect it's all easy everyone's on board everyone's laughing but some nights you know f 10 drunken people walk in and everyone's been listening but they're not so I have to get them on board bring them in settle them down do whatever you got to do like I'll even get people up at my show and they love this like get them all up to do like a Punjabi MC dance so I'll put the, <laughs> honestly they, they absolutely love it I didn't think it'd work I was just all right do you know what I was like this audience is a bit flat Let's try something. So I was like to the sound guy, can you put Punjabi and see him? And then I was like, everyone's getting up. We're all going to dance. Everybody did. And like, they was all doing that. Do you know, like the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole vibe. Oh, they was loving it. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, I've got half Indian in me, but you've got a quarter in you now. And they was like, <laughs> they was like, yeah, they got it. And they was on board. They was loving it. And then after that, they lightened up. It just chilled them out. Mm. And who would have thought it? Maybe, maybe like, uh, yeah, just a few extra bits, like, oh, maybe a little dance or something to throw you off. Yeah. Then your jokes will be back on. Yeah, just a way to get them on your side. Yeah, get them on, on board. Yeah, yeah. So that's crowd work and, like, uh, like being able to earn a room. And you've got to be able to do that for your other comedians as well as yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, just sometimes do a little Indian dance. Like, it'll, it'll do, yeah, whether it's in an argument or a comedy show, it'll, it'll cheer everyone up. <laughs> yeah, it'll get you going. Yeah. What convinced you to get started in comedy in the first place? Uh, I've always loved it, like uh, being a kid and being with my mom and family and just sitting around a TV and laughing to, like, we, I remember we was watching, I don't know if you know the Scottish comedian Kevin Bridges or Billy Connolly um, or, you know, you'll see uh, Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy's old special like on TV and all everyone sat around and they're laughing their head off and I was like, that's just such a beautiful moment, like with your family and in general and then when you get to go and see comedy shows, you're like, this is the best thing ever. To make people laugh or take them out of there, anything be can be going on. Like I grew up in a very rough environment, so seeing comedy broke us out of that. And also joking with ourselves with everything really helped us, you know, enjoy life for that little moment. It might be an hour, but it was an awesome hour. And just seeing my mom laugh or little brother or older brother laugh, I was like, this really connected us. And I was like, I'd love to do that for other people. Be that guy, you know. This is it'd be the most inspiring thing. And uh, yeah, that's what's always drawn me to do it. Yeah. Mm. So what was then step one? So from that moment, you're like, I want to do this. I want, I want this to happen to other people. What was step one then for you to go into that space? Step one. Uh, so to start, you've got to write jokes. You've got to write stuff. 
Uh, so yeah, you've got to start off. With, if you want to be a comedian, I'd say the f- easiest thing to start off with is you'll have a funny story in your life. You'll have a funny story, something embarrassing. It could be anything basic, whatever it's going to be. It might not be great, but the aim's to get up there, and it is the scariest thing to do. Like I think there was like a I don't know if it was a true survey or something like that, but it was about people are more scared of public public speaking than death. I don't know if you've seen that. I saw that. Something like that. So it's yeah. like, you've got to be- beat that. Because like, I think, I don't know if it was like, someone said like, on the other side of fear is something awesome. So you've got to battle that. So I would say, write your material, get a five minute, uh, five minute, yeah, material of uh, jokes and gags you've got ready for the stage. And then you just practice it in a mirror. Like I would practice in front of my girlfriend and her friends. It'd be so embarrassing. Or in front of a teddy. <laughs> Joe and there wasn't busy I would literally Did the teddy have a name? Yeah I'd have a he, He'd never laughed Yeah He's, <laughs> he's been my hardest <laughs> Hardest uh, audience member I've ever had But he's he's honest That's the main thing He's honest <laughs> The day he laughs Is the day you've know, you I, know I've you've made, made it, it. Yeah, yeah. Made, yeah Or I've gone insane That's, yeah, that's the other one But I would practice uh, In a mirror Like with a HP sauce I love brown sauce yeah. A HP sauce bottle And I'll just practice Or I'm practicing for, uh, In front of friends Is then the bottle got, the mic? Yeah it's the mic right, Yeah okay. I didn't have one at the time Now I do But like I just use that and and then, yeah, whatever you got to do, just practice, practice. And then just get up on stage and do it. You start off with five minutes. You really try and craft that. That can take, I don't know, it can take take months to get. Or it can take years to get. I don't know how long. But, like, you've just got to get that five. Practice that over and over. I've had comedians ask me on my new show, can I do that five again? You're like, yeah, yeah, cool. you just got to get that great. And you get another five, another five. You build your way up to do 10-minute spots, which can be paid. And then... 20 minute spots uh, where you can headline or MC and you just work work your way up slowly but surely yeah and how has your upbringing impacted your approach to comedy and your outlook on comedy oh it's, well my upbringing has completely changed exactly who I am as a person mm. uh, because yeah so how I grew up was so was, uh, I don't know if you know Sheffield England like mm. uh, so in the area I grew up was uh, the roughest area in Sheffield we had the highest crime rate with like the poorest residents there. So I grew up in that environment where the most successful person would be a drug dealer. And that's my older brother. So, you know, he's doing really well, you know, <laughs> he's doing all right. But yeah, like uh, growing up, like, yeah, you, like no one wanted to aspire to be anything or be anything. People would try, but then you just get knocked down by everyone else who, didn't, who would always say, you can't do that. You can't do this. That's the thing I heard the most. And I think that's what might have affected my family growing up in that area. Like my older brother is a drug dealer and drug addict. Younger sister had three kids at 20. Uh, and my younger brother smokes weed in a shed at the bottom of my mum's garden. So he's really killing it. You know, he's <laughs> doing well. And uh, I grew up with just a single parent, mostly. Uh, dad's an alcoholic who was abusive. Uh, stepdad was abusive and a racist. So we didn't get on at all. Yeah, the Indian guy and him not, not working. And you just see this these cycles of people just f- following their own trauma that they was... That they, had when they was younger it's just repeating like yeah they must and it's just you just stay in the same cycle cycle and I was like I just want to change it I was like I don't want to follow this at all I don't want to how I was brought up I don't want to pass it on to anyone else because I was like that I I felt awful with that and also I want to inspire my family and the people from where I'm from that you can do anything you want with your life so I was like slowly how do I do that so I'd work on my character I was like I'm not going to repeat anything I've seen or been taught and then uh, as I went to school and college, I uh, got a chance to do a music program. So I learned, I learned drums. I, I did barely been playing. Like I, I only, like the drum kit I had was like so cheap. It was next to nothing. It was like falling apart, but I learned how to play. Then I got into college. From college, I had to do a few years there, then moved to university. With university, I could move city and I could get out of the place where I was from. And then from there, I started working all the time, doing music, playing in bands, playing around England, f- got flew out to do a festival in Europe, started traveling, and then moved over here and just never looked back. Like, mm. it's just gone forward, forward, forward. And then now it comes to comedy. It's that same same kid that was here that had to get out, like, use that same um, same commitment and passion and energy. You can do anything, really. Like, if you grow up in that environment and get out, you just use that in any passion project you use like comedy is mine so it's just I'm going to keep being the best I can be I want to inspire people I've still got like a mission and a journey I want to do where I can earn some money in life and go back and help my mom get out and fly her over here I'm a little brother and just show them that this is a, a new lifestyle you can live mm. so it's like you can yeah comedy and music's great for that like also the people you sport like boxing or football uh, but yeah the arts can really help you 
find a direction in life and also achieve goals you could never imagine. Like because of music, I got to go to college and leave my city and then I ended up flying to Europe. I ended up going abroad. I'd never really done that. Then I got to travel and then comedy over here. Like I get to live in Australia and make people laugh and like, yeah, and eventually that could become a career and I could really help out my family and show them you don't have to follow the same cycles or what you've seen, what you've, what's happened when you've grown up. You don't have to repeat that. You can actually use that as a force to be anything you want to be really. Mm. Yeah. To achieve anything. Does your family know that you do comedy over here? Yeah. Yeah. They know. Yeah. What's their opinions on that? Uh, they love it. They lo- absolutely love it. They loved it when I, they've always been supportive, like with whatever I do when, when it was music or comedy. Yeah. They've, they love it. Like they've never seen me do comedy though. Oh, not, okay. Because yeah. I've I've not seen them in about three years now. Uh, last time I saw them, I was living in Madrid in Spain, uh, and yeah, they've not been over here. So my aim this year is to save up some money and fly them out, and then perform in Australia in front of them. So I better be good because like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. after all that, yeah, keep after, practicing. yeah, yeah, I better keep on it. But <laughs> like I, my mom, it's like when I used to, uh, my mom see me put, uh, playing bands and stuff. My mom's like growing up with only having a single parent. Like I, she's the person I'm scared of the most. Right. Like she'll always go, "I'm amazing." I could dro- drop my drumstick, so I drop my microphone doing comedy, and she'd be like, "You're the best." But I want to be the best I can be for her, just to show that, look, like I've made it this far, and I'm I'm gonna keep going and make it uh, the best I can be. Really, be the best I can be. Yeah. But yeah, um, hopefully they'll see me soon. That's the plan. Yeah, to get them out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mums are always gonna support you. But then you also know, like, okay, that wasn't my best. I can do better than that. Yeah. And I think that's a hard pursuit as an artist to always be looking for the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's, the, you know, that's what we're all constantly working towards. Yeah. Um, with with your comedy, do you talk a lot about your upbringing as well? What do you, like, how does that come up in your actual sets? Yeah, I, t- I talk about, yeah, like, uh, wh- it was not good when I was first starting out. So when I was first starting out, I was talking about my upbringing and I didn't know how to use it very well, so I would just be telling stuff. But it's good to just get stuff out there. That's what you want to be doing. But yeah, I talk about a lot of stuff, especially like my absent father and him being an alcoholic, and use it in bits. And it's so amazing that you you can use that as material to make people laugh. It's you're not laughing. You, it's people get oh, what you're laughing about? You're laughing at him. He's the idiot. He's the drunk. Like that's like people that have grown in my scenario uh, situation are used to environments like this. And what we want to try and do is show people that haven't seen it or people who have and can make a connection with them and make a joke about that person. Like, I'm, I'm the one on stage. I've made it. He's still drinking, doing what he's doing. Like, yes, yeah, so some people um, can get confused with comedy. Like, why would you use trauma or your upbringing in comedy? And it's, like, it's the same as any art form. People write songs and get inspired by other artists. And it's the same as comedians. Like, I saw a comedian called Sean Smith who talked a lot about trauma and stuff she'd been through. And I, some, some of the room were laughing, some were a bit like, ooh. And I made it, I was like watching going, this is art. I connected to it so much. I was like, I've been raised like that. I get that. And that's what voice, the voice of comedy is, is truth. So like being true and uh, connecting to, helping people connect to understand um, a lifestyle they might not have been through. And also having laughter, having fun along the way. Like me and my family used to laugh about these scenarios. And that's what helped us get through it. Um, and now I'm just bringing that to a wider audience to say, this is my upbringing. Uh, I didn't choose it, but it was funny as hell. And I, <laughs> and, um, and also, I enjoyed it. Like, it has crafted me to who I am today, and I won't change that. And if anyone else has been through the same thing, uh, me doing comedy, I want them to be inspired for them to believe that they can do it as well. Because, like, yeah, like, I didn't have a father growing up or a, a strong male role model. So if I could be that on stage for other young young kids or, ad- or adults or anyone like can watch me and go oh he's been through that I've had a bit of that and he's doing comedy well I can get up and do comedy as well or if you want to do music or whatever you want to do in life you can do it like don't let that hold you back yeah yeah what you said about um, people being uncomfortable with like trauma based jokes and things about your personal life mm-hmm. I remember like I've, I've been watching comedy since I was probably 10 and I remember, like, for a while, I was really struggling with that idea as well, like, as I got into more serious, serious, in quotes, comedians mm-hmm. that weren't just, like, one-liner comedians. Yeah. And being really uncomfortable with those stories. But then I watched um, Daniel Sloss. He has a, th- a two-part or a three-part special. And a big part of one of those specials is talking about his um, disabled sister. And right. it, that really, like, drove it home for me. And I, like, really, really recommend these specials. It's one of the best, like, comedy specials I've seen in my life. But... Um, 
the the gist of the special is like he talks about his sister and the disability but he's constantly coming back to like it's okay to laugh like it's fine we're not laughing at my disabled sister we're Mm. laughing at the situations that her being disabled put us in as a family yeah yeah, yeah. and that's that's where the comedy comes from Mm -hmm. and he he does this whole bit and i'm gonna spoil it really quickly um but the whole bit ends um with like the the punchline the reveal of the whole special is that his sister died when she was 13 and um and that's like what got him started in comedy Mm. and it all connects in this big circle but he has this fantastic bit when he makes that reveal where he's like he he loses the audience because the Mm -hmm. audience is like oh like <laughs> yeah now yeah. i feel bad for having laughed yeah. he was like no 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 like mm-hmm. it happened and we laughed and all of those things still are just as funny as they were before she died mm-hmm. the fact that she's now dead doesn't affect that at all no they're the, the, still they're still funny. beautiful moments he shared with her and yeah. he's just using the good times and the funny times they yeah. had together as a memory as well yeah so it's, yes it's your, with comedians you got to really understand that we're we're here to make you laugh and also maybe teach you something as well. Like, enjoy an experience we had. Even if it seems negative, we, we, we enjoyed it. There's some humour in there. And it's just, a, in the end, like, it's a lesson that we should be able to talk about stuff. Because we, we all have stuff going on in our lives. We've all had negative stuff happen. Like, we talk about it in any way that makes us feel comfortable if you want to make people laugh or just tell someone it's best to get it out there and actually talk about these things, yeah. So it's a good positive that I think pe- comedians are doing, yeah, stuff like this, yeah. Mm. If you hadn't had the upbringing that you have had, do you think you'd be doing comedy now? I don't know, yeah. Um, I don't think... I'd, maybe not. Yeah, I think it really did shape me to be who I am in general. Like, with me, uh, I always wanted to... I loved, with my family, something might not be going on that's really good or nice. Uh, so I would like to entertain them. So as a kid, maybe my upbringing was like, I want to be the entertainer guy, just to go, guys, you know... There's some fun fun stuff in life. And I would do little jokes as a kid in front of my mom and they'd all laugh. Like, have you seen The Mask with Jim Carrey? Mm, yeah. I'd do the yeah. walk oh, yeah. like yeah, with the legs, <laughs> like really long. And it just used to crack them up and yeah. just little bits like that in front of the fa- my family. Or I'd do voices or like we had a weird neighbor. I'd like impersonate him and just seeing my mom laugh or family. And something terrible could have just happened just at that moment. Watch him laugh, just break that tension and go... Okay, you know, we can have some fun here. So I think my upbringing really did cement comedy, especially at a young age. I didn't know it'd be comedy. I thought it was going to be music, but like now I'm 29, yes, yeah, the only thing for me is comedy. And I think, yeah, my, my childhood has really crafted that to now me being an adult, yeah. Mm. So you reckon you've always seen yourself as being some sort of entertainer? I would say so. I, I love chatting to people. I love making people happy or making them laugh in any scenario. And throughout my life, I've always been somebody that's usually been like that guy, like say if there's an awkward m- moment, I could break the tension and make people laugh or something like that. So I would say so, yeah. Like I would say it's always been within me. It's just now I'm getting to finally pursue it forward uh, as a career. With comedy and, and talking about your life, th- there's obviously a lot of different ways to be a comedian. Like you can obviously mm. be a one-liners comedian, you can be a story-based comedian. Um, a, how would you classify yourself Um, because I kind of have an idea of how you would classify yourself. Mm -hmm. How important do you think connecting with the audience is as that style of comedian? Massively, yeah. I think connecting with the audience is... Well, for me, it's everything everything I care about because I want the audience to understand my point of view, have fun, uh, laugh their head off and also get a message out of it in the end of what I'm trying to talk about. So I'm, I, I like to storytell a lot, storyteller comedian. I do have some kind of one-liners in there, but usually they're bigger bits. So it'll, it'll be my view on life, um, stories of my childhood, um, how an English guy in Australia is. Uh, I do touch up on racism I've had growing up being uh, Indian and English. Being mixed race is very confusing as well. Uh, and then growing up without a father or the family members that I've had. Um, yeah, like I use all of it and connect it all together to make one kind of big story. Uh, then you'll just take little breaks with one-liners or I'll interact with the audience and ask them like, what was it like with your siblings? Or were you competitive with your siblings? And usually they'll have more of a normal answer than my upbringing because they'll be like, yeah, we, we used to be competitive in Monopoly or, <laughs> you know, like we used to paint Warhammer. Like, okay. And then I'll go, okay, we, my brother and I was competitive in 
um, well, he would sell drugs, so the competitiveness didn't really, uh, you know, <laughs> wasn't equal. I couldn't beat him at that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> couldn't really beat him at that. But yeah, like, and I make a joke that like I'm the most successful person in my family, and I do comedy because their level made it so easy. I just kind of stepped over the bar, like it was easy. <laughs> But like, yeah, but it was, uh, uh, I love telling the story of how I, I grew up because it's such a unique story. Like, um, and there's so much in it. Eventually I want to get like an hour special and really go into detail. Uh, Cause I've told people at like, um, like in, s- in social events and stuff like that before I was a comedian and they always seem really involved and entertained and really like them. Uh, and I always explain that it's not a negative, it's a positive because I grew up this way, but then I've done from that I've done everything I've done because of it. Uh, but yeah. Would you say that you've done everything because of it or in spite of it? Uh, both really. Because like everything growing up, there was always like, you can't do this, you can't do that. Your brother's the hardest drug dealer on the estate. Are you going to be like him? I was like, nah, I'm all right. You know, I might, might want to leave here, you know. So yeah, both. Because uh, everything was against me to not be able to do what I should do. But with I think with the right mindset, you can do anything. And uh, I've never had any like financial backing to get where I, I've got. I've literally had just got a normal job, worked hard, thrown myself into things I love. And when you really invest yourself in it, and it's you're so passionate, it's all what you care about. Big things can come out of it. It just it seems to open doors when you're so into it. It's like if you're half and half. I don't really have that. It's full steam ahead. So yeah, but also if I didn't have my upbringing, I don't think I would be as tough. I'd be like m- like mentally tough, uh, physically not that tough. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, but like you know, like I wouldn't have been able to do what I could, could do now because like I've grown up in that environment. I know what, how hard it is to get out of it and the work ethic you need in life in general. So it, go, it taught me a lot of things. So it was a mixture of both. Like it kind of molded me, but I also had to be it to get out of it. Yeah. Mm. And that point where you decided to move countries that's a massive decision to make obviously being Mm -hmm. like okay i'm gonna leave the place where i've grown up and you moved to europe first you said you lived in madrid for a bit uh that was like a a mix uh so i lived in australia then i moved to madrid for a bit yeah that was uh right so you also you went back and forth yeah it was just a one i was kind of with my ex-girlfriend that i moved there okay Uh, (laughs) that didn't work out very well (laughs) it also doesn't work if you fly to a, a small village in spain and don't know spanish very well uh, so yeah that wasn't easy and also I was working with my ex-girlfriend's dad as a labourer so when he was asking me to pick stuff up I would get it wrong he was not happy at all Yeah, he'd be like he'd say pick this up or do that and he would never never be happy but I was like I don't speak Spanish I don't know why I'm here I don't know what I'm doing like you know so that didn't work out uh, yeah so I was just kind of one off but I, I moved from Sheffield where I'm from to Brighton uh, to study music and I studied at a place called BIM which had a lot of successful artists come out of it and there is very that city was very it's like small small uh, yeah small smallish city but it had a lot of international people coming in uh, a lot of people traveling a lot of people doing things that were not like where I was from a lot of ambitious musicians that I was like oh yeah this is awesome like they're trying to get somewhere I want to be something like and they wouldn't take they believe in themselves and they didn't listen to the people it was like you can't do this you can't do that and I was like that's like me okay we're similar I was around the same sort of people uh, so from there. Playing with my band, we would play in Brighton. Then we started playing around England. Then we ended up flying out to do a festival in Croatia, if I'm right. Uh, yeah, Croatia. I can't remember the name of the festival. It was a little bit back, but it was awesome. And then I would just go traveling. Like, I was like, oh, you can go You can go to other countries. Like, you can leave England. <laughs> I was like, at first it was like, you can leave your city. Like, and then I could leave. And then it's like, oh, you can leave. And then from there, I just got the traveling bug. And I've been all around Europe, America, South America, Asia. Uh, and then now Australia, yeah. So yeah, been around quite a bit. Mm. So someone from where I'm from usually isn't like that at all. Like legit, like there, there's people I know on my estate that still sell drugs, or they're in prison, or you know, like even my brother. You know, I'll call my, my family, and my brother's in in prison because he might have done something, like either sold drugs or got into an altercation um, with somebody. Like he. He's, I would say he's a good guy, but the people on the estate would say he's not a good guy. <laughs> but he's my brother, so I'd say that. But yeah, he's he's been involved in knife crime. He has stabbed people and gone to prison. And then also, he was in like a drug fight with somebody. And uh, this guy like knocked him on the back of the head. Uh, and then had a, this is a bit brutal, uh, but yeah, had a knife and shoved it down his throat. It like knocked his tooth out. He's got a big scar down his tongue. 
and they had the, the, he died like twice in the ambulance and the guy was like you're going to die now shoved the blade in his mouth and then yeah died like twice in the ambulance was on a life support he has got a big scar down his neck where they had to go in and reattach everything and he's, he's still alive now but still involved in the same lifestyle wow. so that's that's like my family back home like and there's loads of people like that surely so that's a natural stepping off point right like that's where you'd be like yeah maybe i'll give this up yeah, yeah at yeah. any point i have a knife yeah. down my throat i'm like maybe i'm gonna find a new career yeah yeah if not for my brother no no he's still still back on it but people are just caught in a cycle mm. And yeah, and some people can't get out of that. Like I was destined to be like that. Like and especially being his little brother, everyone expected me to be the next guy. Yeah. Do you know, like then I was like, it's not the good fellas. You know, it's not like <laughs> you know, you, it's not like that. I'm not doing this. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm out. But you know, like it could have been me, and it can be so many other people. Uh, but yeah, I, I ring them. I always try and tell my brother to get out of it. Stop doing what you're doing. I'm trying to do this for the same reason as like yeah, same reason like. I don't want to go repeat the cycle. I don't want to have a family and show them that sort of stuff. And he's got kids now and he's repeating the cycle again. So yeah, I don't want to, I want to be a message of hope, not a message of unfortunately what my brother's doing. And I believe one day I can maybe help him, but you know, I've tried and it's like after a while you've got to try and follow your, your own path and inspire and help in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, from what you've said, it sounds like a really big theme of your work is trying to help people break that cycle. Yeah, um, I absolutely love that. Like, yeah, yeah. Because I, I never had that growing up. If I could be that for anyone, whether it's comedy or in, even in a conversation, I'll always be like, if you talk about what you're inspired about, I'll be like, you can do that 100%. Because mm -hmm. I, I believe you can. And I, I don't like the people that go, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's because they don't believe. And yeah. I grew up with that all the time. And it's so unfortunate that people will listen to that when, when somebody's like, oh, you can't do that. You're not good enough. And it's like, you are. You are, you just you just believe in somebody that doesn't believe in themselves. Just believe in yourself and back yourself. You can do it 100% if you really want to do something. Yeah. You obviously could have gone down the same path as well. Mm -hmm. What was the the one contributing factor that made you decide that you're going to break that cycle? Uh, just not to uh, do that to anyone else. Because like, I saw yeah. the effects of my brother doing what he was doing yeah. or my stepdad. Or so it was my, more like you, you saw that, but, but obviously everyone else sees it as well. So what mm. made your lived experience different to say your younger brother, for example? Uh, I, I, just for me, I just didn't like to repeat it. It's like, we've all got different mindsets and whatnot. I just wouldn't, I just didn't want to put harm onto people and mm. continue it. And I just, I just, even like, I don't know if it was a little kid, I'd watch movies and you just see them like they're in a tough bit and they'd always break out and they'd never give up. And then they'd always show, give hope to people and help people out. So I just kind of wanted to be that beacon for that sort of life sort of thing. Like, it was never guaranteed that I'd get anywhere, but I always put my all into it and it's just happened as I've gone along. But mm. yeah, like, I just didn't want to do that to anyone else. I've, I've witnessed firsthand what it's like to have a really um, traumatic family upbringing, let's say, like with a lot of abuse and whether it's drugs or physical or racist I've experienced all of it, and it just it, if me passing it on to someone else, do you know what it just continues the cycle. Yeah. It's not fair to do it, yeah. and I'd rather be like, right, do you know what you've been through. I've been through this, you uh, and I've changed my life around. You can do it too, like one hundred percent. And then you you got out through that music program, and you spent years from what you've said. It sounds like working on music. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to stop pursuing music as a potential career and move into comedy? Uh, so I, I play drums and I do love playing drums. I've got an electric drum kit at home because having an acoustic kit, the neighbours will never ever like it at all. <laughs> like they never do. Uh, but yeah, the co co I just love love being on a microphone and just being the just explaining your voice. Like you can do that through drums uh, and playing music and inspire people. But for me, comedy just always had a lure in quality. Uh, and then as soon as I did it, like the first time I knew I was hooked, it was just like, this is the thing I want to do. Uh, yeah. And, uh, with, with music, it was a great stepping stone to help me get out. And I, if I, if I was in a band again, I'd, I'd still love it. But now I've done comedy. I'm like, that's, that's the be all and end all. Yeah. yeah. What was your first time in con com comedy? Cause you're, you're saying that you do a lot of hosting of shows and, uh, you do some of your own little stuff, but what was like the first time? Was it? hosting or was it your own it was my own five minute spot yeah. yeah five minute spot where i was just so nervous before i would I, I had earphones in i'd recorded myself of what i was going to say 
and I just was walking around in circles outside just listening to it over and over again because I was like don't forget what you're going to say don't forget like but I put so much pressure on myself it's like just have fun like I ended up going up there and I did a good job uh, and it went really well uh, but it's just because I went all in I was like I'm going to go for this but then yeah afterwards you know you bomb you go it's up and down it's up and down but yeah just getting five minutes ready and then then just jumping up yeah and then from there, you had that moment of like, okay, comedy's for me. I love doing this. I love being able to tell my story and, and have people on my side. Um, at what point did you decide, was it, was it that first night that you decided like, okay, I'm going to really, really pursue this? Mm-hmm. Or was it kind of a bit further down the line, like six months, a year down the line where you were like, okay, I, I could do this professionally? It was, uh, it was probably the first time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as soon as I was on stage, I was in awe. I loved it. It was just so good. Like, yeah, just walk around, see everyone laughing. And just like, it's like, I wrote this. And like, it was just like, it seemed like a stupid idea. It is a stupid idea, <laughs> but they're laughing their head off. Like they're loving it. And, and like, I was just, uh, just watching a whole crowd, just have fun. It just reminded me of that moment with the family watching TV. And it's like, oh, I'm that guy doing that and giving that, that, that love and energy and joy all around. And it, it was amazing. I was hooked for like from the first time. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I like, f- for me now it's, it's not, yeah, it's just comedy. That's it. Yeah. Like my girlfriend gets sick of it. Friends, it's like comedy this, comedy that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, can't, I, I love it so much. It's so, it's great. And like, I, I hope everyone finds that passion for what their their thing is. And then it's just every day I do it. I love it. I absolutely mm. adore it. Yeah. Yeah. So you just full circled it. You were like, okay, this is this is exactly what I wanted when I was a kid mm-hmm. from yeah, watching yeah. TV. Which it came back, yeah, I didn't really know. Like, uh, my, my first name as a kid was Get Out Alive. <laughs> and then that's the first name. Then the second name was like, okay, music, I really love it. And then after that was traveling. And then after that was like, right, find your passion again. And it just just, just came back. It was like, comedy is it. Yeah. And then I go up and I was like, yes, it is. And then, yeah, I've just been doing it for 10 months, like not a long time now. But yeah, I'm performing like five, to, at least five times a week. Yeah, that's so absurd on. for not even hitting a year yet. Yeah, it's pretty mad. Yeah, like like even, but you know, like I love it, and then because of I love it so much, it's gone well. Like it opens more doors, more people ask you at their venues. Uh, also, I run nights, so I have my nights I perform on as well, anyways. Mm. And then for my year year in comedy, people don't usually do this; they take a lot longer. But I'm planning on maybe doing an hour show on the year to the day. It, it I, I don't know how it's gonna go, you know. <laughs> but like, I'm, I always like jumping ahead. Like it's like I love it so much. Keep keep jumping out out of your comfort zone like I could keep doing the same five minutes and over and over but instead I try and push mm. to do new sets or new things or do hosting or anything I just mm. jump 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 into it you never know if you can do it do it or not you just do it mm. like with hosting like I I legit just got someone just asked me and sometimes people go oh, I don't know if I can I just went yeah why not why not and then uh, then and then I, I got I felt like I was a bit of a natural at it it's a lot hosting's more chatting to the audience, you know, getting them on board, making them have fun. Um, and then when I do my spots, it's more different. It's more more uh, stories and stuff, and it's more more jokes, joke, joke, joke. Uh, but, yeah, um, I, I really love it. And, yeah, hopefully on the year to the day, which is July 8th. Oh, that's, that's close. That's soon, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got to organise <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. I've got to organise it. But I'll throw myself in, like, throw yeah. myself in the deep end. And because of that, like, I, I, it's like when I, the first festival... It was like three months in. Uh, do you want to be on the best of British? Yes. Yes, I do. And then, you know, should I have been there? Maybe not. But I jumped in and then from that, I've got loads more opportunities from it. So just jump in and, and enjoy it. Like the, the worst that can happen is like, you know, like you don't do as well as you th- would have thought. Mm. But I still go in with a lot of energy and have fun. And that's the main thing about it. Yeah. And I think people really, really can sense that when I perform and stuff. So yeah. regardless, like it's like I'm having a great time, you know. I hope you are as well, but I'm loving it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm yeah. the most important person in the room right now. <laughs> um, it sounds like by hosting so many rooms so early in your career as well, you're really setting up a safe foundation for yourself in terms of work. Like yeah. you're, you constantly have like at least, what, five gigs a week mm-hmm. going? Yeah. And that's aside from any other personal gigs that you do. Mm-hmm. Is that a conscious decision on your part uh, on, in like a business sense to be like, okay, if I set up this consistent work... Mm. I'll be set to be able to pursue my my personal career as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Like y- when you're on stage, you're learning the most. Uh, with comedy, you've got to be on as much as possible. Um, 
And yeah, uh, that that was personally because I just wanted to have my own room where I just wanted to help the comedy scene for one because we needed some more more rooms and gigs. And I used to run uh, music rooms in England, so I've got experience with it. So yeah, it was to a get me on stage and learn my craft and be better, but then also give people a chance. Like when I first started, it wasn't always easy to get gigs. Uh, I have to really, really work for it. And um, now I've got rooms that I can help people have that chance and have a go. And there's people who can't get on any other room, but they get on mine a lot. And they always thank me so much. Like, thank you for giving me stage time. I'm like, I'm more than happy to. It, it helps the scene. It gives a lot of people. Like, I could put someone on. They could be, I don't know if they'll be famous one day, but you know, you've helped that step to get to where they want to be. So it's, yeah, as a business sense, it's really clever to start your own rooms up because A, you can be the host, you can set up how the nights go and everything uh, and you can really build up a platform where you're constantly on stage so you can always grow. Like I would love to have my own comedy club one day. I'm always stepping ahead going, but yeah, like I'd love to have have my rooms, uh, earn money from it and then yeah, get a comedy club one day. It'd be awesome, yeah. Is that the best way that you've found to market yourself? Or have you tried other things that haven't gone as well? Or like to, to get your name out there, what's been the best, best way to yeah. do that? Online, you want to be like online. So setting up a, now you, yeah, I don't really have TikTok, but you know, your Instagram page, your, your Facebook page, and then promoting yourself. Uh, you can use like sponsored ads or paid ads. Uh, yeah, setting up your own comedy club because people can see you actively performing. Uh, you'll I, I like I I have a photographer there. Like there'll be, I want to start doing videoed uh, sections uh, which you can promote more and more. And you'll just get yourself out there. Like nobody's gonna f really find you. Like there's so much talent out there. There's so much going on. Like you've got to go. Hey, I'm here, and I'm really good. Uh, and you've got to back it up with your writing and everything, everything else. Uh, and then yeah, when that moment comes and you're in front of the right person, like you never know what could happen. Yeah. So from a business point of view, I'd say, yeah, set up your social medias, get yourself out there, write all the time if this is comedy. Um, and then, yeah, set up your own room um, and then host them or pay for a host and learn and watch comedy as much as possible and perform as much. And you'll jump the ranks quicker than other people. Some people, you know, might do one gig a week, you know, like it's going to take ages to get to where you want to be. If you really love it, start your own rooms up, promote yourself perform and write as much as possible then you'll jump the ranks more like there's no there's no guarantee you'll make it but you'll get closer than the others that won't won't put that effort in yeah that's it too though like people don't see that effort that you put in mm -hmm. um I, you mentioned this at the start how you put in so much work in the background that people don't see and then suddenly you make it mm -hmm. and people think that that's an overnight success and you see it all the time with actors and comedians and and every public figure Everyone's like, oh, they're an overnight success, but they don't see like the six years of like backbreaking work that they've put in. Yeah. Um, for comedians, that would be like running a running, a, hosting a room, or doing a five minute set every day, or writing a like hour special every year that you don't get to perform because you don't have the name to headline a one hour yeah. show. Yeah. Like you just don't see that work. Oh, there's so much work involved in it. Like I. I I'm working like seven days a week. It's like I'm, like when you run a room, not only am I running it for myself to perform, I'm talking to the people, the the bars, the managers, like how they like stuff run. I'm organizing up to 30 people a week because you don't all have the same people on your shows and you've got to organize their time schedule as well. Uh, and then promotion, I'm paying for promotion for the shows. Uh, I'm editing p pictures and uh, making posters. It's constant work. It's mm -hmm. constant work. And you've got to put all that in, and then you'll put all that work in, and then a comedian will drop out five minutes before you start, and you go, thank you, and then now I've got to get another Jeez. comedian. Yeah, now I've got to get <laughs> another comedian, yeah. But it's a part of the game, yeah. Like, um, yeah, then some people are on the comedy scene that want to do it seriously. Some are there to have fun. There's no harm in either. But, like, if you want to take it seriously, I believe, like, to do what I've done in 10 months, not m I don't know many other comedians in this scene. There will be in around the world. There will be loads that have done way more than I have in 10 months but um, I've done so much because it's hard work and it's constant like yeah this morning I was spending an hour doing promo and uh, another hour editing photos and stuff like people might be sat on their Sundays having a couple of cold ones which I'd love and I still do <laughs> I still enjoy myself but there's a lot of time uh, where instead of socializing with friends or doing th fun things I'm, I'm doing stuff for comedy yeah, yeah. And that's exactly it and and that's why creative jobs at the highest professional level 
are worth so much money. Yeah. <laughs> because you've done money. 10 years of unpaid work. Yeah, exactly. You have yeah. to make up for. 100%. That's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Every time I see those articles, like, Tom Cruise got $3 million for three minutes of screen time. It's like, yeah, but he also worked for 25 years of his life with no money. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah. And also, you grow up with a lot of people going, really? Comedy? Is that for you? Yeah. you know? Are you really funny? And you're like, oh, they're like, yeah, I'd love to see you perform. They're like, you don't want to see me perform. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Like, yeah, I, like I have some people I work with and they're just like, I couldn't listen to you for an hour. And I'm like, I don't even know who that guy is. I'm like, okay, right. They're, they're, just, they're just against you, do you know what I mean? Or, yeah, it's not an easy road to take in acting, comedy or, or music or anything. Uh, but... Yeah, when you get to the top, I think you've earned it more than enough. You've done all, There's loads of stage uh, stages I've perf- performed on for free, which I would because I love it. But when you get higher and higher up, you've had to put up with a lot of stuff mentally. Uh, uh, so you, I think, yeah, you deserve it once you get up there. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I think we're going to have to wrap up in a minute. Time's we do. To you are to correct. An end. Um, is there anything in the show that we've talked about or is there something that you wish we'd brought up or a topic you wish we'd spoken about? Or a story you'd like to tell that, that we haven't um, been able to touch on? Uh, I don't know. I think we've actually touched on quite a lot of things, yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, could I pr- uh, promote anything? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, cool, yeah. <laughs> cool. I feel like like it's the office. I'll look in the camera. <laughs> yeah. uh, camera one, two. Uh, yeah, so if I could promote, like, so I run a show um, called All Gravy Comedy Club. Uh, if you follow on socials, uh, you'll find me on there. All gravy, because I'm from the north of England. We love gravy, so just keep it like that. <laughs> gravy and chips, yeah. perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm Daniel Holt, comedian. You can follow me on all socials. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to be really active Like towards the end of the year. I've got split shows coming up. I've got fringe festivals coming up. Uh, that's all not put on my socials yet, but I'm going to be very active towards the end of the year doing bigger shows. So keep an eye out for that on those socials. Fantastic. And it'll all be linked. Um, mm. It always is. It's all in the description and all that fun okay, stuff. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, last question. What would your advice or words be to someone who's either looking to start a career in comedy or is about to start a career in comedy? Just do it. Now, it's, uh, that would be one, like, just, just, just go ahead with it. Like, it's going to be scary. It's going to be many things. Get your first five minutes, two, even two or three minutes, you know. No, no room runner's going to be annoyed when it's your first time. Just get, try and get five minutes, Message a room, message my room, or message many other rooms. Just type comedy clubs on Google. You'll see a search. If you type local comedy clubs on Facebook, I'm sure some will pop up. And then just ask them for a spot. Jump up. Everybody is really kind on your first one. Like, because all of us comics. Your second one, though. That's you, when your they second start one, you. you ain't getting anything. You know, that's <laughs> it. You better start putting in the work. But your first one, everyone will listen to, listen to you. They understand what it's like to be that first time. So even I love seeing comics. I'm like, oh, you do miss that that moment but just go up there and do it message people get five minutes you'll have the best time ever you won't regret doing but even if it's one time doing stand up you won't regret it so just give it a go oh that's oh, fantastic. There you go. heartfelt <laughs> a little bit sweet yeah. a little bit heartfelt yeah um yeah we need to wrap it up we have a tradition on the show for mm. guests um we have an outro song and what what will happen is I'm going to do the outro to camera. It's going to be really weird for you. It's going to mm-hmm. be totally fine for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get to press this button here after we say bye. So what will happen is I'll do the outro. I'll say bye. Joe will say bye. Right. Mm-hmm. You will say bye. Yeah. And then you get to hit this magenta button. Okay. And do I look at the camera when I do that? Do, if you want to, you can. <laughs> you can. I really want to. You can look around <laughs> if you like. Okay. Perfect. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, you guys. Absolutely yeah, appreciate it, yeah. That was fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of The Fro Show. We hope you had a great time. Um, thank you so much, and we will see you next week. Go check out Daniel on all of his socials. And also, rate us on Spotify. Bye. 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 <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well done. You crushed that. Thank you. It's no, like comedy, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, at some point, I'm thinking, like, do I need to tell a joke here? I'm like, oh, I have, like, a message I want to put forward as well. Yeah. So, yeah.